So this presentation is uh, titled What Comes After 2.0 uh, and Airflow 2.0. And Airflow 2.0 was released about seven months ago now. And uh, you may be wondering what the, the big next things that's going to come to the project, to its community. But before we um, go there, I wanted to take a step back and remember how we got here and where we are today. So Airflow now has seven years of history. It first started, if you didn't know, it first started at Airbnb in 2014 uh, by Max Bushman and his team members. And Max, if you're listening to us right now, thank you and thanks for your team. And in 2015, Airflow was open sourced and it started incubation in Apache Software Foundation in March of 2016. So if you um, like incubation process in Apache Software Foundation is a very challenging um, process for any project um, to uh, to graduate from incubation. The project must demonstrate that it's active. It can grow sustainably. It has a diversity of contributors and it it has like good practices and processes in place to uh, to live as an open source project. So through that hard work, um, Airflow was able to graduate as a top level ASF project in 2018. And since then, Airflow has grown and changed a lot. And uh, we had we have had many different releases and a lot of companies have adopted Airflow uh, already and a few other companies like Astronomy or Google, now AWS have started building products on top of Airflow. And uh, so uh, in July 2020, uh, we when we already had this very big, diverse uh, group of users and contributors, we hosted our first ever Airflow Summit 2020. We were very excited to have like to meet all of the maintainers, contributors for the first time uh, in our in-person event. But then pandemic hit and we had to switch online uh, last year. But the silver lining that came out of this, that we were able to reach thousands of people around the world uh, who were able to participate and connect uh, uh, to this event. And um, and uh, after that, like a very big milestone happened, right? Like community worked on Airflow 2.0 and they released it finally in December of 2020, just before Christmas. And uh, it all leads us to today uh, when our like second Airflow Summit is happening and we welcome all the newcomers. We, 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 we're happy about new features and new products and it's uh, Airflow continuing to grow and have a vibrant community. And it, it remains to be the most popular uh, data processing orchestrator ever. So, uh, as a result of all of these things that we did over the years, right? Airflow is uh, uh, was one of the uh, top five most active Apache projects by number of commits in 2020. And like, if you know, there's like more than 350 ACE of projects. So being top five is a big deal. And if you know, there's other large projects like Spark, Kafka, Hadoop, Flink, and we're on par with those projects. We've also had uh, more than 1,500 code authors contributing to Airflow, uh, which is also on par with Spark. And um, Airflow had, has very active community-driven release cycles. We're seeing multiple releases going out frequently for both versions like Airflow, uh, one Airflow two, and this is great for our users uh, who are not able to migrate to uh, second version of Airflow, and they need fixes, they need support, and uh, we support our user community. And um, Airflow is also very popular, and it used by hundreds, if not thousands, of companies around the world. And if you know that your company is using Airflow, please add. The, uh, add them to the list. Uh, it's called, um, like, if you go to our GitHub repository, there's a file called in the wild. Please add your company's name and we'll know um, 
uh, who is using it. Um, so here we can see the testament of the popularity of Airflow. This chart shows the number of downloads per, per week of Airflow packages from PyPy. As you can see from the graph, the growth has been tremendous. We can see in red uh, downloads for Airflow 2.0. So it's very exciting that the community is adopting this version that uh, like Ash and Caxil and many others worked tirelessly uh, throughout last year. Um, while we can't really track exactly where people are running their airflow, uh, uh, running airflow, but we can see where people are visiting our website and reading our documentation. So in this uh, like map, you can see that our community is global. We have big user communities in large cities around the world. Uh, the top ones are Bangalore, New York, London all of US West Coast, Moscow, Beijing, Sao Paulo, and others. Um, you can also see like uh, smaller clusters all around. And this is very exciting. So as adoption of Airflow grows, uh, we expect to see demand for more new use cases, um, new features. Uh, we expect the problems to get more challenging, more interesting. Therefore, we uh, ask you to give us feedback, share ideas, and especially we, um, we want your contributions to make um, Airflow a better uh, project and uh, next generation project. Um, so like I, I spoke a lot about how uh, Airflow is a great popular technology, but Airflow wouldn't be what it is without its community. We believe that the community is the biggest is Airflow's biggest strengths. So like, and you can see this um, big picture because we say it's all about the hive and not the honey. Uh, we value community over code and this is the motto of Apache Software Foundation. And this is, and it's really embedded in Airflow's DNA. Uh, what it means, right? It means um, that we, we uh, do not tolerate toxic behavior from any member of the community. Um, no matter how great the code might be. And um, this is because um, good interaction, healthy uh, environment um, creates a welcoming um, space for new people and new people uh, uh, make new contributions to Airflow, which contributes to long term sustainability of the project and long term sustainability means success for us. Uh, we also open source first, and as you know, uh, there are many companies that fund contributions to Airflow, including Astronomer, Google, and um, like while we work for these companies, all of our contributions uh, must benefit the project first and should be in the interest of the community first. And we also strive for the transparency in communications, in decision making. We work in open source channels. We accept feedback from everyone. And it doesn't matter if that person is like committed or not committed. We like value all of the feedback that you share with us. We also work to ensure that Airflow's um, management committee, uh, PMC for short, uh, is diverse and many views are represented. It means not only vendor diversity, but um, the diversity of background, uh, skills, and expertise. And um, last but not the least, we stress uh, a lot on recognizing uh, non-code contributions. Uh, we uh, value contributions to our documentations, our website, our events, our processes, as much as we value the code contributions. And uh, I am an example of this. Like my contributions to Airflow has always been um, to improve processes, advocate for inclusive uh, project, uh, advocate for Airflow itself, organize events and other uh, things and I'm very grateful that the PMC recognized my contributions and voted me as a committer to the project first, then uh, as a PMC. Um, and um, 
And uh, one of the projects that I'm very heavily involved uh, in uh, Airflow project is organizations of the summit. And I wanted to mention it very briefly here because here like um, it shows how the project has grown over the last year, right? Like we hosted Airflow summit in July, 2020, how our project changed since then. Um, so like we had like 6,000 registrations like last year, right? Like thousands of people attending live and all of that. And we're close to 9,000 uh, registrations at the opening, which is a great milestone for us. And uh, we continue, we, we grow the number of our like sponsors and partners um, and we really thank them. And uh, we hope that um, it is because we uh, really like created really great event last time around. That's why more people are interested, more people see like what uh, what we do here, like and um, like how many people connect here. So we're grateful for all the support that our partners are giving to us. And we also um, like really grateful to all the like hosting cities. Like last time around, we had eight different uh, cities um, host like one or two days of Airflow Summit. This year we having the same number, but different cities, like little bit, uh, I mean, not all of them are different, but new cities have uh, arrived. Some cities are not hosting this time around, but uh, we really appreciate all these meetups organizers around the world who continue to uh, stay engaged and continue to host uh, meetups in their respective cities. And, um, and, Lastly, I wanted to mention how quickly our like number of committers are also growing because it's good for the project. There are a lot of people working on the project and PMC is recognizing them. And like since last July, we have grown the number of committers by 50%, which is great. We have more people to uh, to review code and 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 change code of Airflow and improve it and make it better project. And um, before I hand it over to Ash, I, I wanted to thank him, his team, and um, other people who worked on Apache Airflow 2.0. Their names is Kaxil, Yarek, Kamil, Tomek, Shadong, uh, Ash here, and many others. It's been a very, very large effort. Thank you guys for everything you uh, did. and. Um, yeah, like with this, I want to <laughs> let Ash tell you what they're planning to work on uh, post Airflow 2.0. Here you go, Ash. Great. Thank you very much, Ash Jamal. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, culture, community is, is so important. It's what makes Airflow what it is. Um, so um, I guess kind of a little history, um, it's useful to know where we were, where the project's been, kind of where it grew up from. Um, as I mentioned, it kind of grew up, came out of Airbnb in 2014 and 15. Um, it was primarily a an ETL tool. Um, that's, that was kind of, that was, and mostly still is what most people do. Um, but also, I want Airflow to be more. I don't want it to be just an ETL tool. Um, so kind of like what, what I'm hoping to, to present here for the rest of this, this session is a vision for Airflow. It's, it's a possible future. Um, Airflow is a community project. So what I say doesn't hold any more weight than what anyone else says. Um, I can spend more time on Airflow, but my, my, my kind of, I get one vote, everyone gets one vote. So this is just kind of my vision and it's kind of like I'm hoping to put forward a, a vision of Airflow that excites people and that I hope will kind of like inspire a few, few more people to join us and, and work on it. Um, so when I was thinking about this, I, I asked on the mailing list and I said, like, you know, what do people want? And there were lots of great ideas, but they were shorter term than I was looking for. I want like, what's, what's the roadmap? Like, hey, I want Airflow to fly my rocket ship to Mars. P.S. Don't ever do that. Um, Airflow is not designed for, for, for flying a rocket ship. But you know, I kind of want that kind of thing of like some some like big vision. Um, so I kind of took 
kind of spoke to lots of people, spoke to some users, and kind of t- took a few things and kind of went, what are the three tenants kind of of the roadmap? DAG should be a joy to write. So kind of you go back to 2015, DAGs were they were pure Python. And at that point that was that was unique. That was the selling point. It's like it was no YAML or it was no uh, point and click GUIs where you have a pain if you want to track change or anything like that. So like that was good, but we can now do better. So with the the task flow API um, that was added in 2.0, um, kind of the, the app task decorator and the task group task groups, we've we've got somewhere there. But I think we can go more. So like this is just like not getting into specifics here, but this is just like bags should be fun to write. They should be easy to read and and understand. And currently, there's too much boilerplate in there for my taste. The next one is. I want Airflow to be the go-to orchestrator for every data workflow job. Um, Airflow right now doesn't care what you're doing, and that's great. It means you can run Terraform in Airflow. Um, I know people who've done that. You could run your continuous integration, your CI/CD system in Airflow. Um, I, I have in my head ideas of how Airflow's own CI system could be written in Airflow, um, and then I've forgotten it because I don't want to write a CI system. But um, like that's great. But if you're if you're orchestrating data, I want Airflow to just be the default. Um, so it should handle all the common cases. It should be nicely. It should be extensible enough to meet everyone's need. If you've got a data workflow job, Airflow should be able to do it. And finally, Airflow should be easier to operate confidently. Um, this has been kind of like it's getting better over time. But there's always kind of a, a few weird cases of. Airflow stall, or this task isn't running, or where did this log go? Um, and we should fix those. Um, like we should, we should make it easier and kind of more in the upfront, in the user's face, in the operator's face of this is what went wrong, or this is why your task is stuck in this state. Um, just so that you have confidence that Airflow is doing what you want it to do. Um, so yeah, just kind of they're, they're, they're them all, all the tenants at once. Um, so. Um, that's just kind of like my background and my thought process. So coming at this from a slightly different way, um, Airflow 2.1 was released at the end of June, so a few weeks ago. Um, and we follow a roughly three-month cadence for, for, for kind of point releases, so 2.1, 2.2, that kind of thing. Um, so what's going to be in 2.2? Um, this one is kind of much more definite because we sort of know the big features coming in 2.2. So there'll be AIP 39, which allows you to run um, DAGs on customizable schedules. Um, so why, why this DAG? Why, do we, why, why this AIP? Why do we pick this one? Um, ultimately, execution date is confusing. Every person, almost without fail, who learns Airflow gets execution date wrong. Um, it makes perfect sense once you know it, but it's not what people's intuition tells them it is. So we kind of talked around and spoke to a few people and like, okay, is there any way we can save this? No. Okay, so like we're just going to deprecate the term entirely. This AIP has been voted, it's been accepted on, and it's, we've started work on this one, so it's coming. Um, we're replacing execution date with um, a couple of new terms. There's a data interval, which says like, this is my window of data. So make it an explicit concept rather, concept rather than previous execution date and next execution date, all that kind of stuff. It's like, no, data interval start, data interval end. Um, we're removing the, now that we have a, a, a fixed data interval concept that, that a DAG run applies to, um, the schedule now doesn't have to be for that particular time. The schedule, schedule date could be in the middle and then um, you can kind of set the start and end wherever you like. Um, and finally, kind of customizable um, timetables, we're calling them, so that you, kind of users can choose whatever timetable and scheduling behavior they want. Um, so long as you know, there's a fairly simple Python interface that your class must present, and then you can get what you want. If you want it to run um, on every day but the Sabbath, you can do that. If you want it to run whenever the markets are open, at noon, you can do that. Um, so it's just kind of like giving control back to users. Obviously, we're going to have a few of these built in. But yeah, let's just kind of have the basics, the batteries included, and then give control over the users. So that's one. The other big feature we have coming in 2.2 is um, 
AIP40, which is deferrable operators. Um, so this is the generalization of smart sensors. Um, smart sensors were um, a nice new feature, an experimental feature in 2.0, which was contributed by the fine folks at Airbnb. Um, they, Airbnb are still one of the largest single users of Airflow in the world, to my knowledge. Um, and they took a look at their running clusters and realized that an almighty percentage of their resources were taken up with sensors just sitting there waiting for, in their case, HDFS, I believe, um, files to appear. Um, so they kind of took a look and had a way of like combining sensors together. Um, that was good. And then Andrew Godwin, who's giving a talk later, not about this, but he's giving a talk later today. Um, he He's very strong on Python async. So he took a look at this and went, I've got an idea. We can generalize this even further. Um, so it is. It is a way for any operator, not just sensors, but any operator to defer themselves and kind of hand control back to Airflow. And they enter um, kind of this async trigger loop so that you can combine thousands of async operators into a single process rather than wasting a whole executor slot for each one. Um, so we picked this one because it's kind of like it's the extension of smart sensors, the existing feature. And it should, um, for any kind of big, big clusters, it should. Be, be able to massively reduce the resource usage. Um, so that's the two we've got for Airflow uh, 2.2. Um, when will that be? Mm, or August, September time. That's kind of like we're following the roughly three months. So kind of if the last one was 2.1 was at the end of June, then 2.2 will be kind of August, September. Um, so that's kind of. The things that we know are easier, and those are those are kind of fairly firm. Um, and then, like, what about the rest of the year? What about two point two, two point three, two point four kind of time frame? Um, so, I, let, I guess let me first address the kind of the, the elephant in the room for anyone who's been paying attention. Um, at the start of this year, we voted on AIP thirty eight, which was a proposal to overhaul Airflow's UI. Um, Ryan did a Ryan Hamilton did a fine job um, redesigning essentially and reskinning the UI for for two point um, but it's it's seven year old kind of UI tech it's creaking um, if we want to make changes it starts to get more and more difficult so we kind of sat down and we thought hmm let's let's come up with a plan so let's kind of like react react it reactify the app because a single page app as much as I generally don't like them as as a rule um, a single page app for Airflow makes sense. Um, and yeah, so we kind of planned to do that, uh, and also at the same time to kind of sit down and think about the the UX and the information architecture and the information flow of the UI because the Airflow UI has been written by developers and it shows. Uh, no one's ever once sat down and thought about um, what should go where and kind of the, the hierarchy of things. Um, and we started working on it. And then we ran into a couple of problems. So the UI, no, the API, the existing kind of REST API, the new one, that is the, the open API specified one, um, doesn't have all the endpoints we need. Um, coupled with that, that people are adding new features to the um, existing Flask App Builder UI. Um, we didn't want to chase a moving target. Target. We don't want to have to say like, no, you can't add anything to the UI for six months while we, while we rewrite it. That's just not good for the project. So we we decided that we are going to add all the missing N API endpoints we need first. And one of the ways we're going to do that is an Airflow CTL, for lack of a better term. So if you've got Kube CTL, which is a local client that speaks to a remote Kubernetes cluster, Airflow CTL will be a Airflow client that runs locally and speaks to a remote cluster. Um, the goal here, my thinking here, is that this is just a tool that will anything, no, almost anything that you can do with a current Airflow command line, you should be able to do over, the, over this API. Um, you, you can't necessarily run tasks directly. You can't manage the database, um, you know, upgrade, downgrade, migrations, that kind of thing. But almost everything else, should be able to do, be done over the API. Um, 
So that, that's kind of like once we've got that, that should give us 90% or higher of the endpoints, API endpoints we need to build a, U, uh, a UI. And then once we've got that and we have confidence that it's complete, we can then hopefully not have to chase a moving target. Untrusted workers. Um, that is. So, Airflow's kind of execution model. Currently, the, the workers, the things that execute your task, perhaps should be called runners, but they are, they have direct database access, um, which means all your user code, all your DAG code, has direct database access and can do anything the Airflow scheduler can, including access all connections and change the state of any task. Um, so that's that's not great, particularly not from a multi-tenancy point of view. Multi-tenancy point of view. Um, I know, kind of Apple. This was one of their uh, pain points, and um, Cloudera had similar similar things. So one of the things that we're thinking about is to remove that direct database access and trust the workers as little as possible. They can tell us the status of their task and they can and nothing else. And everything everything else they do will be over an API. And we can then apply permissions so that you can say like, yeah, essentially only DAGs in this group or this tag should be able to access this connection. Um, just things like that. Um, and also this actually kind of helps with scaling a little bit because one of the Scaling points we found I, we found in my testing of Airflow 2.0 was the number of active connections to the database actually started to become a bottleneck as you scaled up the number of workers. Um, on Postgres, using PG Bouncer helped, but let's like I think we can we can get rid of that and kind of fix two problems at once here. Um, Lifecycle hooks. There's a few um, like you have on success. Callback on failure, callback and on retry, callback probably. Um, but they're kind of incomplete, so we should add a complete suite of them just to let kind of let people run code when they like. Um, and also easier notifications. Um, it's a fairly common pattern, not universal, but fairly common. Um, which is. Um, just send a Slack message when a DAG fails. Because you know, if something fails, you probably want to know about it. And right now, you kind of have to do it. You have to write some code yourself and use the operator and create a custom function. This is silly. This is a common pattern. We should do this ourselves. Um, something like this. This is not code that will work. But this, this is my idea for um, kind of a generalized operator fra uh, notification framework. So on failure callback, and take, just takes a function. Send Slack message is a callable that returns something. I don't know what at this point. I'm just designing the interface. Um, or down here on the second one, you can have two messages and then I'll call them in sequence. Say um, this kind of thing should be should be built into Airflow. It should be it should be this easy to send a Slack failure message, or perhaps even easier because, um, as I say, it's such a common thing. Um, next up, dynamic DAGs. So this is something that sort of works in, in Airflow right now, but not very well. So there are two kinds of dynamic DAGs. Um, there are ones where the structure changes a little bit, or a lot, but you know the structure changes a little bit. Um, and then there are the DAG factory ones where the structure is the same, but the the inputs, the parameterization, like run this for all these 10 markets kind of thing is, is the same. So to address the first case, one of the one of the things that I certainly did um, have done in the past using Airflow was kind of a fairly standard, I guess, ETL workflow where you know I have a data provider gives me a data set, you know, delivery of files into an S3, S3 bucket every every week, every day. Um, and I want to, first thing I want to do is wait for those files to arrive, make sure I've got them all. There's kind of, you know, complete flag or whatever process. Um, and then I want to process each of those files. Um, right now, if you wanted to have one, you know, one task per file, there's no easy way of doing that. Um, so 
this is what we're kind of playing with. We're coming up with the idea. Um, so I kind of highlighted the keywords there of partial and map. Um, if you are kind of familiar with functional programming, you know, Python's partial and map, it's, it's the same sort of concept. Um, and what this will do in the UI, just to kind of give you a, a fair idea of how this works, um, the, this is, doesn't exist. This is all just kind of implementation plans and stuff. But this is so like process file there will it'll have a flag saying, hey, I'm a mapped task. Um, and the scheduler knows that before it actually starts executing that for the first time, it needs to kind of get the XCOM, get the data, and expand it out and create, in this case, three, um, three task instances and kind of like actually expand it. Um, so yeah, just kind of like this, this, lets, this lets you get some kind of static dy dy dynamism. I've been saying kind of thing. It's um like the structure changes and it's like having multiple copies of the same task with a different input each time is fairly easy for the scheduler. Um so we just kind of, you know, if we flag things appropriately, we can do that. Um and then the other kind of dynamic DAGs is um something like this, excuse my made up um marketing DAG. Um but yes, kind of, you know, if you're running a, a digital ad campaign and you have a list of markets and each of those markets has a list of campaigns and some detail about them, and you just want to kind of, you want to do this DAG for all of my, all 20 markets. And they've got, you know, 300 different um, campaigns across them. Um, you can do this right now, sort of, with a, a DAG factory. So you have a factory, we just call it and pass, pass in the parameters and then, you know, you get all those DAGs out. But it might be nice if this was, say, um, controllable from the UI, so that you could have kind of like if if you have a parameter DAG, parameterized DAG such as this, um, then you could kind of set a list of default parameters in the UI, and just kind of gives you some nice, nice ways, nice alternate ways of controlling it. Of course, if they're in the UI, you can't do, it, you can't track it in Git. So, Git-based things would still still feature strongly here for people like that. But you know, it's kind of kind of just giving some more tools in people's toolboxes. Um, a better cross DAG story. So right now, if you have one team writes a DAG to process the data set, and then another team writes another DAG that kind of needs to feed in with that data set, you have to, you have to cooperate a bit when you're writing your DAGs. You need an external task marker, and then to do it properly, you want an external task sensor back on the other side. And it works, but it's not the nicest thing. Um, with 2.1, you can now see the dependency between DAGs in the UI a bit, but there's still some things we can do better here. I don't have an answer. I haven't really thought about this enough, but I think, yeah, we can, we can do better. So let's kind of plan out for, for better native cross-DAG support. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know, six, nine months' time to, to, to do all that. Realistically, probably 12. Um, but what's even further ahead than that? Um, kind of, you know, more exciting. So event triggered DAGs, if we have deferrable operators and we already have an async loop running in Airflow, um, maybe we can have a process that only triggers the DAG when there's work to do. Um, this could either be API, you know, inbound webhook requests, responders, um, which you could do already. You wouldn't need much support for that. But maybe it's a, a run a loop every five minutes, check if there's an idle EMR cluster that's just kind of sitting there using resources. And if there is, create this, create a run, run of this DAG and shut it down. Um, so we just kind of have a little bit of kind of like inversion of control world and run this every X. It's, is there something to do? Then run this DAG. Um, key difference there would be right now, if you just have it run every five minutes, you see a lot of DAG runs with you know, nothing, nothing, with lots of success. Um, and it would just be nice if you didn't have to pollute the DAG run table effectively with all these extra stuff. If you could just only run the DAG when you're reasonably sure there's something to do. Um, DAG versioning. Um, right now, if you deploy a DAG while a run is in progress, um, it changes the structure right then and there. The next task that picks up will use the new structure. Uh, the UI will show the new stru structure. So, yeah, there's kind of two things to do there. One is to Fix the UI so that it always shows the structure that ran. Um, that's just kind of like absolutely just it's almost kind of like categorically 
showing the wrong structure is incorrect and a bug. Um, the design decision, but it's, it's kind of a bug in behavior, so that one should be fixed. Um, and then coupled with bank deployment, um, if you can make sure that a task always has the same version of the DAG, then it kind of like makes sense that if you deploy mid-run, it doesn't change the structure and it's kind of like consistent, um, just kind of a lot more, a lot easier to reason about. And one of the ways we will do this is just kind of like some easier ways of, um, yeah, easy, easy ways to, to do deployment. So rather than kind of having to have an external Git sync or you bake it into the image, um, which is kind of like, if at, there's a couple of proposals which we'll kind of look at resolving around kind of like DAG manifests and DAG fetches. But, you know, if you could point Airflow at your Git repo and it knows how to check for updates and things, then you can tie a running DAG to a Git shard and then like all runs of that DAG and just reuse that shard. I can pull down that particular shard. Um, so it's a lot more consistent and perhaps easier to deploy. Um, here's a big one. Streaming. So I said at the start, Airflow was kind of an ETL world. And it is. It still is. But I would like it to not be. Um, so like, there's two kinds of streaming. There's, there, there's full-on proper take the fire hose of Twitter's tweets and try to process it. Um, right now, don't, don't even come close to trying to do that in Airflow. It's just not built for it. Um, but there's also kind of micro batching, which is where you just kind of take run, run a task frequently. So you run a task every yeah fifty milliseconds or something. Now Airflow's not going to do that yet. Maybe it's not ever going to do that. But it, but let's let's see how close we can get. Um, so I don't know what street, what people who are running streaming need. And to some extent, this is kind of selection bias of if you're using streaming, you don't use Airflow. But if you do streaming in your company. Um, please get in touch with me. Let's have a conversation. Let's work out what a streaming, what better support for streaming could look like in Airflow. Um, let's replace XCOM. Let's have something richer. Um, the data object. Um, XCOM does an okay-ish, a bad job, depending on what you need for it. Um, it's better now with the Kind of pluggable XCOM backends, um, which Vikram and Efrahim are speaking about later on in the summit. So check out their talk. I think near near, near the last day. Um, but also, that's only part of the story. Um, I said earlier, kind of Airflow doesn't care what your tasks are doing, which is a strength. But also, we can do better if we do know what you're doing. So kind of again, simple examples. If you have an ETL job, if you could just somehow emit a metric saying, on this run, I processed 73 million rows. And then every run emits those. And then, hey, you can graph them. So that's kind of part of this. Um, and then also the, the, the data object. Maybe you have a data frame that you want to patch. You know, if the inputs don't change, I can just reuse this data frame. And then if the inputs change, I'll build a new one. And then I'll automatically delete the old one. Or maybe you want the data frame. I'm kind of assuming like pandas style data frames here, um, or maybe you've got a data frame that, that wants you that, that's big. You want to calculate it for a DAG run, and then you want to delete it at the end automatically. Um, let's kind of like build some concepts like this for managing data and kind of like data lifetimes in Airflow. Um, this possibly also ties into better to better lineage support. So you can kind of track for, you know, if you're in a kind of regulated environment and you need to know the input data sets, maybe this ties into it in some way. Um, and kind of, yeah, better support for machine learning. So um, there are some tools already that are kind of special purpose for machine learning. Um, kind of there's, there's Ray, there's TensorFlow, stuff like that. Um, and I don't think we should compete with those. Um, but also, we can do better in Airflow without competing with them. We can have, um, if you take the concept of kind of yeah like reduce report supporting some re reporting not supporting reporting some information about your dag run back um and parameterized dags you can combine those together um you could then have like fitness scores for models exported so you could run three dags with 
different input parameters or three copies of the same DAG, I should say, with different input parameters. And you can output fitness scores and then graph them over time and then kind of build upon that to then promote models and things like that. So yeah, this is this is all just kind of not very concrete, but things I want to work on, things I want Airflow to work on and get better at. Um, so the that's kind of my my vision. One last thing, thank you very much, Caxel, for stealing my thunder. Um, when's Airflow 3.0 going to be announced? Um, so there isn't an answer to this one because there's not a timeline for it. It's Airflow is now following Denver semantic versioning. Um, so 3.0 will be out when we decide to break backwards compatibility. And I, I think it will be a decision. Um, we've done quite a decent job, I think, so far of um, maintaining backwards compatibility. So the goal, the intent, is that if a DAG works on Airflow 2.0.0, it should continue to work for any release in the two two um two point X series. Now, it gets kind of a bit a bit of a grayer question when um one person's bug fix is another kind of breaking change because they were depending on that bug. But you know, Denver gives us an intent of what do we mean to do. Um so essentially Airflow 3.0 is going to be when we decide that, you know. People have had enough time to migrate to 2.0, and another migration is not going to alienate our users. Um, this won't be a Python 2 to 3 thing. Um, this will be will have been kind of like signposting the changes for a while, and it will be this class name no longer, you know, it has been deprecated and finally removed, or this parameter is gone. So it shouldn't be a big change. It's not a Python 2 to 3 thing. It's just a, you know, hey, you pay attention to the warnings that will have been emitting for a couple of releases. and rename your classes in advance and you should be good um so yeah that's kind of that's 3.0 it's it's whenever it's ready um to give you a rough idea of time let's say 18 months but you know all roadmaps are a lie this entire presentation is a lie hopefully it's a useful lie that gives us something to talk about and um a conversation um cool thank you i will